Hi, my name is Rod Cleef, and I'm the host of the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. And every week I interview multifamily rock stars, and we talk about how they've built incredible wealth for themselves and their families through multifamily properties. So hit the like and subscribe buttons to get notified every Monday when a new episode comes out. Let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. And we've got a real treat today. A uh, gentleman's name is Donato Callahan, and Donato is a whopping 23 years old. He's already in 176 doors, has another 120, I think, uh, closing on very, very soon. Um, and he's got a very interesting background. So I'm really excited uh, for this interview. We're going to have a lot of fun today. Welcome, brother. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you bet. So why don't you... Uh, you know, it shouldn't take too long because you're not old enough to have much of a long <laughs> history here. But why don't you talk about, um, you know, you started to talk about what you did in college. Mm -hmm. um, I know you were a high school valedictorian in a class of 350, which is damn impressive. So uh, beyond that, talk, talk to us why real estate, when you got excited about real estate, everything else you've done. So just kind of take us from there and bring us current. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so really my start in real estate happened during COVID-19 mm -hmm. when everything shut down. I had no options. I was bored out of my mind and I realized that I was not in control of my financial future and other people had more control over it than I did. Mm -hmm. So I started a wholesaling company during my senior year of college. I was at Boise State University, ran that the entire year I was in college, actually got something under contract and quickly realized that I wanted to transition into an asset class that I could purchase, got me cash flow, tax benefits, and I could do the work once and continue to benefit from it in multiple different ways. So so when you said you could do it once, would it, was there, an, was there a, a, a business model that you considered that you had to do it more than once? I'm just curious when you said do it once, so just help me ex understand that. Yeah, so my whole thought process with like wholesaling or flipping properties is once you find the deal and you fix it up and you sell the property and you get that check, you're no longer collecting benefits off Oh, got property. it, got it, got it. Yeah, it's you're only as good as the last deal. Now I exactly. understand what you meant. Okay, please continue, sorry. Yeah, of course. And so when it came to um, rentals or o actual ownership of an asset, it made much more sense in terms of I can buy it and it'll continue to pay me and benefit me for longer periods of time. The reason in this podcast is called Lifetime Cash Flow. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so no, you're just music to my ears. Okay, now I get it. I, I wasn't sure where you were going with that. All right, please continue. Yeah, of course. And so when I started saying that ownership was the key, more units made more sense. If I can have more cash flow, more units, lower risk when it comes to uh, um, occupancy if someone moves out, owning something that had a lot of units made the most sense. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got interested in syndication. Mm -hmm. So after uh, shutting down my wholesaling business, I got introduced to a wholesaler who was interested in moving to syndication space. Mm -hmm. And about spring break in my senior year of college, I found a 96 unit building in St. Louis, Missouri, wrote an offer on it, got it accepted, hired contractors to come check it out. And I uh, ended up graduating college, road tripped back to Iowa, got back home around 10 o'clock at night. That's where you're from, Iowa? Yep, got, got it. from Iowa. Went to bed about 10 o'clock. I was in my car the next morning at 4 a.m. driving to St. Louis to do my walkthrough right after graduating college. Hmm. That deal ended up falling apart when he got close to the uh, signing the contract. But it was quickly after that that uh, my actual old uh, landlord in college, who I'd spoken to about real estate investing, and she was interested in you know c continuing her journey, introduced me to a group group she was joining and mm -hmm. that she was getting into multi a mentorship group right? exactly yep. yeah yep like our warrior program got it it's like exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So she was interested in syndication. She invited me to come with her into that education group, and I did. And a year later, we closed on our first 172-unit building. Where where at? That was in Waco, Texas. Oh, in Waco. Okay, mm -hmm. good market. Okay, fantastic. And um, you talked about wholesaling. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you, um, I did a post in our Warrior Facebook community. God, I don't even know how long it's been anymore. Matt, do you know? It's About a year. It's, oh, it's more than that. No, it's more than a year. It's probably, I, I think it's closer to 18 months. But anyway... Um, I asked how many of these people in the in our program had wholesaled a deal and made over a hundred grand, and twelve of them had, and then two of them made over a million wholesaling a deal. So you know a lot of people talk about wholesaling single family, and you know you make ten, twenty, thirty grand max, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you know you can make some serious money wholesaling multifamily as well. And so, um, are, you you mentioned St. Louis a couple of times. D do you own assets there as well, or? Okay. Yes, I do. Uh, okay. So at the same time that I was getting into large scale syndication with my landlord, right. uh, I purchased a four family house hack in St. Louis, actually the morning of my 22nd birthday. 
So you live there? I live there right now. Okay, you're in that fourplex, your house hack in that fourplex. Yes. Living for free, most likely. I live in for free and cash flowing 1200 bucks a month. 1200 By this October, it'll be 2400 bucks a month. Holy cow. So you're living for free and you're making 2400 bucks on the place you live in. Exactly. Guys, I hope that's what we call a clue. And I want to tell you something else. You mentioned something a minute ago, and I want to flag it. You got your ass up at 4 a.m. to go check out a property. That's called dedication. That's called discipline. That's called making it happen. And that's what you have to do. You know, when you're willing to grind for a few years like most people won't, you live the rest of your life like most people can't. And that's what that's called. You know, I'd love to know where that drive comes from. So where, where does that come from? Oh, man, I've been asked that a lot of times. And... Really, it's a recognition of the fact that no one's coming to do it for me. Hmm. I have the capacity to create a life that either I'm going to love living or regret having lived based on the actions or choices I do or do not make. Well, you're an intellectual guy, so you're probably in your head a lot. You're thinking a lot. You're planning a lot. Um, I know you're with the Department of Defense right now as well. Yes. Talk so, about that for a minute. Yeah, so uh, on top of syndication, my house hacking, uh, by day I work for the Department of Defense as a geospatial analyst. Hmm. So writing reports, working numbers for you know higher-ups in the government. And what is geospatial analyst? Basically, we work with a mapping and imagery, so think like satellites, and being able to take pictures of what's on the ground, analyze what's happening there and write that up in a way that senior policymakers can make oh, informed decisions. Oh, so you analyze what you see and give an opinion based on it. Exactly. This is like a freaking spy movie, man. That's cool as shit. Now, I understand these, I know you can't probably go too deep, but you know these cameras can read a freaking pack of cigarettes and what brand it is from space, so it's pretty impressive. I remember we used to have these, uh, these domes in Denver when I lived there, there was these like circular uh, half of a, of a sphere that had these satellites in them or some something that connected to satellites or who knows but anyway but uh but anyway so that that is very very cool and um i know that uh um well you said you know your description of your why um kind of gives me some questions do, do you have a background that uh you know a history of familial familial history of struggle mm -hmm. or talk about that a little bit Yes, no, my parents uh, divorced when I was pretty young. Okay. And so most of my life from maybe four years old to 15 years old was half the week at mom's, half the week at dad's house. Mm -hmm. And it was back and forth. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was different economic you know, um, success between the different uh, both sides. And so it was going between different types of clothing, different types of food, different location, different friends, just back and forth. And I was pretty- So you got to see two sides of the coin then? Exactly. Or live two sides of the coin? Very much so. Okay. And so- Growing up in that way, realizing that there's different ways to go about life and there's different, you know, earlier on realizing that money equals some level of stability in some ways, you know, whether it's going to be what vacations you have, where you work, where you are, uh, what you eat, what you wear, um, what your quality of life is. I recognized early on that money had something to do with that stability. Hmm. And so as I grew up, I recognized that, okay, right now the thing I can not control is school. And so I'm going to be my best student I can be because I know that's right now the traditional way that my parents have told me sure. like, if you get a good grades, good school, good college, good job, you can create a more secure, stable life for yourself. Sure. And if you have the capacity and the willingness to do the hard work that other people won't, you'll be able to get somewhere that other people aren't. You heard this from your parents? Uh, when it comes to that. the hard work that other people won't piece uh, a little bit. Um, okay. A lot of it was me observing what the reality was around myself and my family okay. and coming to those conclusions more internally of I always ask people around me when I was a kid and probably pissed them off all the time. Mm -hmm. Why? Like, what do you make? How much money do you make? Uh, what kind of lifestyle do you live? Hmm. And do you like it? And this started taking notes, you know, this person makes this much, they live like this, are they happy with it, yes or no? And this understanding, okay, if my parents are making this much and I know their lifestyle is this and they're happy about it, these are all the different stepping stones I'm looking at to help curate what is a successful life for me. Hmm. Life's about being happy, you know, and, and I mean, there are people that don't have much that are happy and there mm -hmm. are people that have every, everything financially and they're not happy. and. So, you know, happiness comes a lot of different ways. In fact, I was going to do an Instagram reel on happiness today, and, and just today, actually. That's why it's top of mind for me. And, you know, happiness can come from giving happiness as well, because whatever you want, you give. You want love, you give love. You want happiness, you smile at people. They'll smile back. You're happy. It's, you know, you give, if you want money, you give money. You give of your time. That's the way God works, the universe, whatever you believe. 
you give what you want. So you're in this mentorship group with your professor from school, wasn't it? Your professor, you said. I'm an old landlord. Oh, landlord. Yep. Our landlord when you're in school. So you're you're in the, you're in this real estate group. Do you believe in mentorship? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Why? My thought process is if I have 10 people around me who've been doing this for 10 years and I ask them the question, where did you succeed? Where did you fail? And I get out of my own way, toss the ego and just listen to them. Now I have a hundred years worth of experience guiding my decisions. So as long as I can just sit down and shut up and listen to people that have been successful and apply that in my own life, I can go around some of the hard knocks because they already did. Mentorship is the only way you're able to you know, exponentially grow in this industry or any industry yeah. because you're standing on the shoulders of giants. That's it. No, no, I, I couldn't agree more, obviously. Uh, I guess that's a little self-serving comment, but the bottom line is I've had mentors my whole life. I still do. I have coaches and mentors and, and you know, learners are earners. But if you want to accelerate the speed to success, you hire coaches. Michael Jordan had I don't know, five, six, seven coaches at the height of his career. And, and you know, you mentioned, you really mentioned, instead of mentorship, you really mentioned the group dynamic. Um, and, you know, I think that's why our Warriors are so freaking successful. They're upwards of 170,000 units that we know of right now that they own. I've only been teaching five years, and most of those units done between Warriors. And when you're in a group like that, a rising tide lifts all ships, right? Mm -hmm. And you're not around people that are naysayers or afraid of your success. Have you, let me ask you that, have you encountered people that, either tried to diminish your goals or or tried to you know naysay your goals and and tell me who they were maybe sometimes it's family but tell mm -hmm. me who they were and, and and just talk about that for a second so first off all the time all the time all the time okay uh i've had colleagues at work compare me to nixon and say that because i'm real estate i'm a criminal Oh, Jesus yeah. Christ. I get that. I get that hate on my <laughs> social media. You're a landlord. You're a piece of shit scum. Yep. I'm like, okay. All right. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I get sucked in. If they, if they dog my wife, I get sucked in mm. sometimes. But other than that, I leave it alone. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I've had to be a little like, you know, controlling on what I share with so many people in which mm. environments, because mm. sometimes I recognize these individuals that I'm around do not share the mindset. And when I talk about this, they're not interested in saying, oh, you have the skill set. How can I do it to kind of learn from you? It's you're doing something that either I'm afraid to do or I don't have the, ca the capacity to do or it's an avenue that I'm not willing to expose myself to. So I'm going to tear you down. Right. They're going to try to diminish you so they don't feel bad about themselves. Exactly. You know? and, and, you know, they tell themselves stories as circuit breakers so they don't feel like crap about themselves. And these are the people that I get hate from online all the time. They're the ones that, you know, it's either through entitlement or fear or limiting beliefs. They don't believe they're, 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 they, they deserve it or they can't do it or they're not smart enough or strong enough or have enough time or whatever. And, you know, I tell people the reason the acronym for belief systems is BS is because they are BS, but people <laughs> believe them, you know, and, and you, you mentioned something really important. You, you said you, you have to be careful and control your conversations around people until you know whether or not, you know, they have a, a, a progressive mind or not progressive is the wrong word. They, they want to do more with their life versus stay static. And I'm going to tell you, that's super important. And, and guys, listen up on this one. You know, when you've got a dream and it first comes to fruition, I mean, you first start thinking about wanting to do something. Maybe it's multifamily, maybe it's something else, whatever it is. And it's a dream. It's a fragile thread. And if you share it with the wrong person, they can break that thread. So you want to be very, very careful who you share that with. Would you agree with that? 100%. Yeah. And, and then, you know, once it's more solid and secure, then you can just, you know, tell people what they can do with themselves or ignore them or whatever when they try to diminish your goals but you got to recognize as well that you know like you said people out of their own fear their own limiting beliefs their own you know afraid of being uncomfortable their own fear maybe fear of feeling less than if you succeed feel uh, or, or maybe they love you in some cases even and they don't want to lose you because they know you're moving ahead that's mm. a dynamic as well and so all of that comes into play and you know the sad reality is most people default to a peer group that they go to school went to school with or mm -hmm. went or work with and they're not proactively choosing their peers and and again those people can can hold you back and and sometimes it's family you know love your family but choose your freaking peers proactively right yes yeah could not agree more you know i've had um i love my family uh, they're also some of the first people that tell me Hey, maybe don't forget your day job. Mm -hmm. As no matter what I'm doing in real estate, mm -hmm. this, this, this make sure healthcare is expensive. Let's make sure that we uh, keep these things protected. Mm -hmm. And 
sometimes it's difficult because you know some of the people in my family have been entrepreneurs mm. and third generation entrepreneurs. And they and they fell or, or no, and they successfully sold their business. Okay, and they, but they're they're not diminishing you, are they? They're the first ones that say, "Don't forget your day job." Really? Yeah. Interesting. I know. Wow, that mm -hmm. makes no sense at all because they stepped out and did it anyway. Wow, I don't understand that at all. There's got to be something else working there. But you know, most entrepreneurs will move from one thing to the next thing. With you know, we're like sharks. An entrepreneur only dies if they stop swimming. You know, right. and I tell people I've I've had I've built 27 businesses myself, several worth tens of millions of dollars, most spectacular failures. I call them seminars. Uh, but <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. So you know, I have a lot of people on my show that that listen to my show or watch my show that, you know, they see the economic headwinds we're facing. They see, and, and, and I'm, if they've listened to me enough, they know I see it as massive opportunity. I think there's gonna be incredible opportunity in this country. I saw it in 08 and 09 when I lost everything and I, I really believe it's about to happen again. And they know they need to do something. They mm -hmm. sit and they listen to my show, you know, it's entertaining, whatever, but they haven't taken any action. What would you say to those people? I would say, take your money, identify the most elite, trustworthy, highly successful operating team you can when mm -hmm. it comes to multifamily investing, because it's not necessarily about the deal, it's about the team that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Find the team you can work with, identify their criteria, and start investing with them mm -hmm. now. <laughs> like passively investing. Exactly. Okay. Be a limited partner in a team that you can trust, and a team that has that track record, just like yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is going to be the type of ship that people can ride through choppy waters as we move forward into a tumultuous time in the markets. I, I absolutely agree with you. And passive investing is a fantastic way to start. But what if somebody doesn't have a lot of money to get started? What would you say to that person? And maybe that person, you know, so so they can't start passively because most people want 25, 50, 100 grand to invest passively. Mm -hmm. uh, our minimum's 100 on it for accredited investors. And, you know, yours may be less, but, but you know, you're not going to go less than 25 grand in most cases. So, mm -hmm. so right, you're shaking your head no. So, so what, what would you tell those people? that know they need to do something with their lives to get out of the freaking rat race. So mm. they're not in the same place a year or two from now that they are right now, unless they freaking love where they are right now. Mm. What would you say to them? It's not gonna be popular. That's okay, okay. it's not gonna be mm. popular. Reassess what you actually need. And when I say that, I mean, my plan was not to move to St. Louis. It was mm. to go to the DC area where mm. the Department of Defense is mainly located. But I recognized that my opportunity as a fresh college grad to be able to buy real estate was a much higher opportunity in St. Louis. Good. The prices were better, Good. the rent, the rent, uh, rent uh, prices were better, I had a better opportunity to get in a house hack and start the life that I knew I wanted to build. Great decision. And when I talk to individuals today, it always burns me up when I say, you know, you could go do a house hack, you could go, you know, start learning about real estate, you, start, you could dedicate time or energy mm -hmm. or dedication to learning about this. Yeah. And the answers I get from them, like, ah, oh, you know, I, I love my massages, or I, I'm spending too much money anyways. Like, you know, I got a wife. They don't, they don't want it. They don't want it. They don't. Yeah, they just don't want it bad enough. And and I will tell you, that's the reason that my boot camps, the first thing we do is goal setting on steroids, because how the hell do you get anything if you don't know what it is? You got to know what you want. It's the first thing we do. You've got to create what Napoleon Hill calls a burning desire. You got to right. want it, because that's how you push through that crap. That's how you you get up early, 4 a.m. like you got up, you know, you you wanted it. And, and you get up early, you stay up late, you do whatever the hell you have to do to make it happen. So you create the lifestyle that you want. And, uh, and, you know, and that's why I spend so much time on mindset in my conversations, yes. on my podcast, at my events, because it really is 80 to 90 percent of it. You, you, that's the problem with these people you just described. They just they don't want it bad enough. They don't have the mindset for it. And so, um, yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you. You know, even if you just go to YouTube University, for God's sakes, even my boot camp, my boot camps are freaking, you know, if you DM me, you can come for $197, three days of training, nothing being, I mean, I talk about my coaching for about 30 minutes. That's it. That's the sale. Okay. The rest of the time, it's all, you know, drinking through a fire hose, you know, so not for some people that can't afford to travel or the hotel, I get it, but man, educate yourself. I mean, I believe, let's talk of market conditions for a minute. I'll tell you what I think. I think we're headed, you know, we've got 1.6 trillion in debt coming due by the end of next year. You, those people either have to refinance or sell. Mm -hmm. Sales are 75% down first quarter of this year, 75% year over year decline. And we know what's happening with refinance. I mean, bridge debt right now is about 9%, okay? So, you know, a lot of these guys that got bridge debt these mm -hmm. last couple of years, um, you know, they're struggling and, and their debt service coverage ratio is not where it needs to be. And so to refinance, they're either going to have to put money in, right? 
Yep, capital and, call. Ca and they're going to have to have a capital call. I mean, I just I got a, I literally just got an email from my attorney, and I will read it to you right now. I'm not going to give you his name, but I'll read you what he just said. Um, hang on. Jeez, I had a lot of emails already. Okay. Um, we have about 45% of our clients doing cash calls, loans, and trying to do forbearances right now. And this is a big hitter in Texas. You would know him. I'll tell you after we stop recording who it is. But, uh, but I'm going to, so, so, and this is a, I mean, this is a guy that, that deals with a lot of my warriors. And, and, you know, luckily my warriors aren't in, thank God, I mean, knock on wood, mm. not having too much trouble right now. But, uh, um, but there are a lot of people that are, you know, I went to a couple industry conferences this last 60 days and, you know, the IMN mid-market conference, I, I keynoted MFIN in Charlotte and, uh, you know, there's a lot of sweat beaded up on foreheads that, you know, um, I'm surprised there's not more stuff on the market with lower pricing yet. I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I think these people are thinking the rates are going to come down, but Powell just said they're not. Yep. He said they're going to raise them again. Yep. So what are your thoughts on all this? Completely agree. I mean, okay. we have individuals who I think we're on the back end of that belief that we're still in 2021. Uh, like, I can get those prices. I can pump that price per door. I can still get $180,000, $200,000 a door, no problem. And now we see large defaults or foreclosures when it comes to Houston portfolios. I'm sure you're aware oh, of yeah, that. Oh, yeah, that, that, that was one of our competitors, uh, you know, student, and he lost 3,400 units. And, uh, I mean, he was a nefarious guy from what I'm hearing now. He ran to India with a bunch of money. But... You know, which is a black eye for the industry that scares investors, which exactly. is just which sucks because that's not the norm. But, you know, I do think, you know, we're going to see some pain and we're going to see some investors lose their investments. And, you know, I hate that. But, you know, I've, I'm going to look at it through rose colored glasses at the opportunity that's coming. And we're creating a, a, you know, an opportunity fund for distressed assets. And it's just about done. We'll have it done here in, in about a week. Uh, but, you know, I, I with crisis comes opportunity. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, and so. with this crisis, I think those individuals who have stayed true to the morals and the principles of like multifamily investing and syndication will be revealed, and so too will those who come through this industry and maybe don't have the best intentions. What's coming down the pipeline? The, the water's close. going out, and exactly, it, and we're going to see who's naked. Exactly. Bottom line, we're yeah. going to see, and yeah. so you know you'll have individuals who have some egg on their face, and you'll mm -hmm. have investors who end up taking their money, realizing that hey, I may have lost money with this person, but these people. Are still, they're not naked under the water. Mm -hmm. And so they'll be flocking to those individuals who actually mm -hmm. have the capacity. Because yeah, they're still going to want those returns, and hopefully they don't lose their capital. I, I think there is going to be some capital losses. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, a lot of this debt is held by banks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I, I pulled a Forbes. Actually, I've got it right here. Actually, this episode uh, or this issue of Forbes talks about the office occupancy in the top six uh, cities in the country, Chicago and all that, and the average is 70% occupied. Those assets don't cash flow at 70% occupied. So they're either going to go back to the, dip, the banks, and, and again, I think we're going to see some significant bank failures. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I don't want to scare you. I want to get you excited because opportunity is coming. So, so back to you. In your lengthy career, <laughs> <laughs> Um, talk about some, some, I mean, you've done a lot in a short amount of time. So I will tell you, you've compressed time. You compressed time by getting involved in a mentorship group, you know, aligning with people that are making stuff happen. Very smart. You've compressed time. But that said, talk about some epiphanies that you've had along the way. And it can be in the single family space, multifamily space, but just some like, okay, aha moments. Now I get it. Talk about that. If anything comes to mind when I ask that. Sure. One of the first ones is actually when I, when the reason I got started in real estate, you know, I had, um, thankfully during college, I got this scholarship that, you know, paid me some money to go to school to the Department of Defense. And I've been saving that money up. And my family was like, you got to put that money in the stock market. I said, okay, great. You know what? That's what you guys did. I'll, I'll do that as well. And I did it. And then COVID hit. And I watched the value literally half wow. overnight. Wow. Literally half of it gone. And it was that moment that I realized and I asked a question that every real estate investor, every entrepreneur has ever asked, you know, like, is there a better way? That was the first moment that I realized that I was not in control of my own financial well-being. Yeah. There had to be another avenue that I could build it and be in control of it and continue to grow it. Mm -hmm. And that's what first got me into looking into real estate. You know, I've got a webinar next week talking about the fatal mistakes that, that investors make. I've made these last couple of years, uh, like bridge debt, um, you know, um, not, not 
raising enough operating reserves. I mean, yes. I, I know these operators that have no operating reserves at all. Yep. And like I, a big operator came to me and wanted me to help him co-GP on a deal. I mean, this is a big name you'd know. And I looked at his pro forma and they're pulling the, they're going to pull the operating reserves from cash flow. Yep, yep, straight you, from cash flow. I mean, you, you, you talk about a recipe for disaster, you know? And then then I looked at his rent pro forma and he's performing 7% this year increase Ugh. and 5% each year thereafter. I mean, come on, seriously? Mm -mm. That reminded me, you know, of someone else whose pro forma I looked at, and everybody knows him, uh, initials GC, and I looked at one of his pro formas, and it was 10% a year for five years. Absolutely not. No, it's not not a chance. I mean, the average this year is 2%. And that's what we underwrite in our deals. We're saying, okay, natural run growth, 2%. Right. Because just because the last three years was super hot, you cannot go into the next market assuming that. No. Absolutely not. No, and, and... the same operator. I just had somebody really well known who's, who's raised money for him send me a text, and he's like, "Should I do this deal?" And I looked at it. And I'm like, "They're they're claiming they're going to get the expense ratio down to 36 percent in the first year." And I'm like, that, "You don't even get that on a brand new asset." And that this actually happens to be a brand new asset, but you don't even get that. There's no way. And so, uh, definitely not in Texas where this is with the high insurance and everything else. Mm-hmm. So. But anyway, you know, um, by the way, guys, uh, when I'm talking about expense ratio, the average is about 50%. So, the, you know, 50% of your income is going to go to property-related expenses, does not include debt. Um, but so let me ask you this. As you're moving forward in this multifamily syndication business and you're buying assets and you're already, you know, doing some small multifamily as well, what do you think is the most challenging part of your role well, my role, I specialize in due diligence and market research. Okay. So what I'm what I'm answering for the team is why are we investing in this state, this city, this neighborhood, this property? What's happening around the asset itself, and what's happening with our competitors to understand why we buy in this property and why is it a good deal for us? And Got so the it. difficult part, I think, going forward is one identifying the right markets for us to be looking into and capitalizing on the most opportune uh, most opportunities possible. What markets do you like the best right now? I like secondary and tertiary markets in central and northwestern Texas. So okay. I like Lubbock, I like Waco, I like San Angelo, I like Amarillo, and the deal that we're working on right now is in Arlington. How's the insurance up there? If you know the right person, not too shabby. Really? Yeah. We like did, how much per unit? You're not going to believe me when I tell you this though. Seven okay. fifty a door. Really? Yep. Wow, that's not bad. Got a pretty awesome provider. That that's we, not bad. Yeah, that's not bad. We I were mean, looking at we're 12. getting quotes at two thousand. Yep. We're looking at a deal in Louisiana. It's three thousand. <sighs> I mean, it's just insane. From five hundred, that's what the seller is paying five hundred. So, tell me, what's some of the best advice that you've ever received, and uh, as it relates to real estate specifically? Some of the best advice I've ever received when it comes to real estate would definitely be. Find the individual that's doing what you want to be doing, mm. make their life easier, mm. and they will open the floodgates of wisdom to you. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's really good. Yeah, you you add you try to you try to add value to people. I get hit up all the time. Can I come work for you for free, free and yep. whatnot? You know, but uh, and which is which is basically what we're talking about here. But uh, you know that that's a great approach. Absolutely a great approach. Let me ask you this: Did how did you get past the fear? Um, of doing that first big deal? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear you say it. Yeah, well, first off, when you're approaching it, I know there's a lot of lot of book reading, a lot of failures that go into this, but mm-hmm. definitely didn't start off with this magical mindset, take a lot of growth and reading and understanding where people have failed and asking a lot of questions. But aligning myself with a great team mm-hmm. that has a track record, that has the experience to know I'm gonna be coming in and I'm responsible for this piece of the puzzle, and that piece is gonna help complete the entire picture of making a successful investment. So first off, the right partners was crucial in getting over that fear. And secondly, instead of asking myself, what if it fails? I started asking, what if it goes right? What if this property actually does close? What if we are able to implement the renovation plan or able to get in, rent other units, increase the rents, bump their occupancies back up? What if it works out? How life-changing could that be? And instead of being like my own worst enemy and kind of tear down like all the different possibilities that are out there, being my own biggest supporter and realizing, yes, there's risk, and with the right partners, we can mitigate that, and choosing to believe in the possibility of what if. No, that's good, and that's good. And, and the only caveat I would say to that is, and I love that, you look, you're not just looking at what could go wrong, you're looking at what could go right. The only caveat I would say to that is, is to not look at what could go right to the extent that you overlook what could go wrong, right. okay? That, you know, I talk about, you know, when you first get a property under contract, um, 
you know, you might have looked at 300 deals to find that deal and you get it under contract and you're doing backflips the whole way home. At that very moment, you've got to take off, you've got to put on the hat basically that says, why do I not want to do this deal? Yep. Because sometimes the best deal is the one you don't do. And so, and, and it's very difficult. That sounds really simple, but it's very difficult because as human beings, when we make a big decision, it's human tendency to look for reasons to shore up and justify the decision we just made, not look for reasons to negate it. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to be careful with that uh, because otherwise you'll subconsciously overlook things you shouldn't be overlooking. Absolutely. So, um, but that, I do like what you just said though. L look, at the, look at the positive side as well. So let me ask you this, you know, you want happiness and I think, I think you know, and you want success, whatever that means to you. Tell me what success means to you. What, what's success gonna look like for you? Success to me, uh, in a short form, board games. I love playing board games with my family. My parents and I, my 21st birthday, I spent playing board games for 14 hours with my folks. When I'm able to go home, I sit down with my parents at the table. We're spending time together, sharing, catching each other up in our lives, and we get to play board games. And what success looks like to me is having the time to be able to go home, sit down at the table with them, go back with my grandpa, smoke a cigar with him in the pool house, and be able to dedicate the time that I want to with the people that continue to fill me up without having to put in a request at work, without having to wonder if I can afford the trip to get back home and being able to continue to do the hobbies and work with the people that uh, really fulfill me the most. Nice, nice, that's good stuff. And so it's time freedom, basically. Time freedom. Yeah, that's your definition of success is time yeah. freedom. I'll tell you a story real quick. Um, one of the people that I work with at my job uh, he's been working for several uh, several years. I think almost 15 or 16 For what? Years. I'm saying he's been at, working at, for what? At the Department of Defense. Right, but you said something else. Uh, he'd been working there for about 15 or 16 years. Okay, I misunderstood. Years. Okay. And he didn't have any, doesn't have any kids. And mm -hmm. so I was wondering, you know, you know, almost 20 years in, maybe he might be close to a traditional retirement. Mm -hmm. So I went over and I asked him, because I'm always curious about these types right. of things. Hey, you've been here X many years. Are you close to being done? And he laughed in my face. Really? He laughed in my face at work. And he, what he said to me, I'll never forget. He said, Donato, I've mentally prepared to do another 17 years. Okay. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> when you, when we both know that real estate, you dedicate your life to it. You, you put in the time, few short years. You, you can, can do it in three years. Three you can years. build the life of your freaking dreams in three years. In three years. Right. And so to be a person with the mindset of I've mentally prepared to do another 17 years is telling me I'm prepared to waste 14 of my years. Yeah. For this for comfort yeah for comfort is right for because of, of fear and i'm assuming you're in a room of a lot of analytical people yes absolutely yeah which and of course you know for an analytical person when you're an anomaly in this regard for an analytical person to make a decision they have to check off every and i love you you know who you are you have, they have to check off every single box and then very often they can't check off all the boxes they don't take action mm -hmm. you know and for those of you that 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 that, that shoe fits um just recognize that you're not going to see the whole path, but you got to take that first step in faith. Dr. Martin Luther King said, you take that first step in faith, the next step will be revealed. And, and, and here's the analogy that you, maybe you've heard me say this before, if you listen to me a lot, is, you know, you can drive all the way across this country at night, your headlights seeing 60 feet in front of you, and you know you'll make it. You know you'll, you'll, other people have made it. You may have some obstacles, but you know you'll make it. It's the same way with this multifamily business. And then if you align with a group that's already done it. You know, you don't have to build the wheel. The wheel's already built. You just have to work the wheel, which is what you did, right? I mean, you just stepped in and found your your spot on your team. Exactly. And, that's, and this business is a team sport and there are lots of different hats. You can be the, the acquisitions person finding the deals. You can be the, the uh, investor relations person raising the money. You can be the person like you that does the due diligence and, and advanced underwriting. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's, what, that's how you get into this business and that's the beautiful thing it doesn't matter you know you just determine what your superpower is and that's what you bring to this business so let me ask you this are are anything else that's kind of weird about you that nobody knows about you oh man nobody knows about me um geez louise uh when i was in uh high school and uh, college you know i people always looked at me um and i was a bigger kid Okay. I was uh, definitely thinking of the Michelin Tire Man. That was me as a kid, for okay, sure. Okay, gotcha. Um, but I love bodybuilding and weightlifting. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in high school, I went from 225 to 135 in wow. nine months. Um, it's actually another kind of a cold turkey story. 
I remember one day I got super upset about something, something like my mom had said, you know, as a kid, mm-hmm. all that, you know, frustrates you. And I started making food because that was my emotional kind of like outlet mm-hmm. was eating at that point. And I remember I was making this sandwich and I was about to put it in my mouth and I stopped. I was like, what am I doing? And I ran outside of my backyard. I threw it. It was comfort. Yeah, yeah. so you're doing it for comfort. Oh, threw it you. in the backyard, threw on my tennis shoes, and did a uh, little Tubby Boys version of running as far as I could on the bike path. And I got about a mile. That was an epiphany moment. That was an epiphany moment. Yeah, got about wow. a mile, and uh, then I had to walk myself back. But Vomited. And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rolled around like, oh, man. So was- you, you, you're into weightlifting. Do you like my gym down there? Oh, I loved it. I went right? to a couple, couple of pictures down there. Did like, you? That's oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. No, no I, that's my pride and joy. It was a two-car garage, and I converted it. To oh, this incredible, uh, incredible gym. I'll have to do a video now and show you guys what it's. I'm really proud of it. So let me ask you this: You know, you are you are freaking valedictorian, so you understand school. You understand what they teach in school. If you could teach school children one thing for an hour or two a week, what might you choose? So as far as a topic or anything in the world, you, I don't care. Discipline. Discipline. Good answer. Absolutely. Okay, so, t- so expand on that a little bit. Discipline is the ingredient that will make a fantastic cake or, you know, a deflated souffle. Hmm. 100%. That is cooking, the- cooking metaphor. You like cooking. I do like cooking. <laughs> I like eating it too. <laughs> Discipline, I would say, even at my young age, is the thing that differentiates a lot of what I do from the, some of my peers around me. Not to say that I'm this special guy who done this right. the stuff, just showing up mm-hmm. on a consistent basis asking how can I do more, how can I help those around me, and then working with individuals who are asking themselves the same question, how can I do more, how can I help Donato? Mm -hmm. Being disciplined in your actions day to day is what gets you further than anything else. Love it, no, that's such a great answer. That's not the answer I expected, but that is a great freaking answer. And you know, I'll tell you, uh, which is why I spend so much time on mindset in in all of my communication, because it's 80 to 90% of it, and you know, you've got to really want what you want to create that discipline in yourself so that you get up at 4 a.m., like you said, and me get my ass in the cold plunge that I just mm-hmm. got every day for five minutes. I'll show it to you when we're done here. And uh, it's, it's been kind of cool. We, we set it up really nice. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's that willingness to get uncomfortable, right? Yes. You know, the, the, the incredible life of your dreams is just on the other side of comfort. But And you don't have to be uncomfortable forever. But that's why I did the, started doing the cold plunge because that I was really not looking forward to it. I, I, bought, <laughs> I bought Wim Hof's book, The Iceman, uh, a guy named Wim Hof. He's can go in ice for like hours and, and to learn his breathing exercises and everything else because I was not looking forward to it because I like to be comfortable as well. I'm like, man, I need to get uncomfortable. And now I love that damn thing. Man, it's been awesome. I, I literally go in there every day for five minutes. But, um, you know, are there any things, as you've been doing this, I mean, you got your full-time job, now you're doing this multifamily gig. Were there any things you had to cut out of your life to make this happen? Any sacrifices you had to yes. make? Speak to sacrifices for a minute. Absolutely. Um, and I think you alluded to it a little bit earlier, but the t- period of your life where you're sacrificing things, it is a season of life. Mm-hmm. And I found it, it's extremely crucial that even for myself, when I was going into this period of my life to say, look, I'm going to give up a lot of things right now. And that's going to, ha- I'm going to do that for these reasons to get to this goal. So what do you have to give up? One, um, a lot of social activities. Mm. Uh, so I'm not going out very often with friends. I'm not uh, spending money frivolously when it comes to like certain trips or hobbies or things like that curtailing my spending and then my time you know uh, most of these days i'm up at five i'm at work at six i'm working six to two or three wow. then i get off work and i have 30 text messages five missed calls and i'm in meetings where i'm working from 3 30 to about 10 o'clock at night mm. at that point i go back to bed and continuing to do that over and over and over again and saying no to trips saying no to in recent months i've had to take some time off the gym even to be able to continue to like, hey, I this don't is give the, that up too long. Not too long, you know. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, I've been doing it for like six years, where I'm, I'm able to take like you know a six month uh, time off and take some information and you know dedicate the extra time. But thankfully, we're coming back in that point where I have more time in my schedule. That season you is need ending. to make time for that, brother. I'm just telling yeah. you, you know, energy, you know, to do what you do, and you, and those of you listening, listen up, you know to have a family and kids and a spouse and and even if you'd by yourself but you're you've got a full-time w-2 gig that is consuming like yours Mm -hmm. and you want to build this side hustle 
it, it requires incredible energy. And to have incredible energy, you need to be eating well and you need to be exercising, period. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, 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 I can't stress that enough. So let me ask you this. Talk about some setbacks or some failures on this journey in the real estate side of things, and we all have them, and it's think of a, try to think of a doozy, and maybe the lesson you got, if, mm-hmm. if anything comes to mind when I ask that question. Sure, uh, one of my first wholesale deals, uh, okay. definitely. Uh, I locked up a deal from a seller, uh, had a property she was looking to sell, she was out of state, and I had gotten to sign to a local real estate investor, and I was gonna make $25,000 on it. I was gonna recoup all the expenses I'd made, give me a little profit, my first successful real estate investment. And about a couple weeks later, I got a text from the seller saying, um, what's your address? And I thought it was odd, but I gave it to her. A week later, I get a letter from her lawyer asking to get out of the wholesale contract. Mm-hmm. And what had happened was, you know, her son, who's living there rent free and spending all of his money on trucks and boats and not taking care of the property, had talked to mom and said, you're going to throw me out. I'm going to be on the street. What are you doing to me? And weaseled his way back in. So now, and now, now that's the guy that just sends me hate messages on, <laughs> on, on, my, on my social media. Anyway, yep. sorry, I interrupted. No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so I was faced with uh, this decision, you know, am I going to, as a 21 year old at the time, gonna try to fight this? Am I gonna try to, you know, get in between this mom and her son and force this transaction? Or am I going to cancel the contract, basically burn a bridge with this buyer who knows not gonna trust me anymore and eat the $25,000 in operating costs? And I you cho- had twenty five grand in the deal. I, I the entire time that I've been working on wholesaling companies, spending out mailers, dialing. Oh, I um, see, I see, gotcha. Yeah, the, the the money that you spent to be able to get that deal. Exactly, gotcha. Uh, this this one deal is going to recoup me for all of it. Right. And I had to make a decision, and the decision I made was, I'm going to let her out. You let and her out. I let you her out. It. Wow. Let her out. It was you know I, my thought process was and some great advice that I uh, was g- given to me by uh, my one of my partners now is that no pillow is as soft as that of a clear conscience. Yeah, oh, no question. The, our number one core value in every one of my companies is integrity. Exactly. We do what's right even if it freaking hurts. And, you know, there was a, um, a book uh, by a guy named Huntsman, a billionaire. Yeah, the book's called Winners Never Cheats. It's a small book, it's incredible, but it's about that. It's about doing what's right, man, and that's why you're successful. That's why I'm successful. You know, it, it, you do what's right, it, like, it, like I say, even when it hurts. So what are you not good at? Because mm. you're good at a lot of stuff. What are you not good at? Um, I'm not good at letting go at okay. all. Um, it Give is, an example. Uh, so within uh, the company, uh, another company that I work in, a uh, software company I founded, Bright Investor, mm-hmm. um, I read the book Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. Oh, that's a great book. Great book. Yeah, in and, fact, I've got it right next to my recliner right now. It's literally right there. It's yeah. fantastic. Mm-hmm. And my partner, uh, he, he reads By the way, if he said that fast, called Who Not How. Okay, please continue. Right. Yeah, so my partner is massive into reading books and continuing mindset and education. And so we first started getting together. He was telling me, hey, look, we're going to be business together. You got to read this book. And reading, it's all about... You can be a who for someone else, but you also need who's that have the skill sets or the capacity to do things that can make overall your ventures more successful. And so putting the right people in the right seats and continuing to recognize that even though I can do something, maybe I'm not the best person to do that thing and my energy is best spent somewhere else. And then consciously letting go and allowing them to fully fulfill that role has been a challenge for me. Mm. And having that trust in all the people to believe in what we're doing and dedicate themselves in the same way that I would to the role. And as a business owner and person who's founded 27 different companies, you know that's like it's no, your that's, baby. That's the, that was my biggest hurdle as well, is, is giving up the reins. I mean, the CEO of every business is always the bottleneck. You can ask Matt up there. I mean, that's the CEO is <laughs> always the bottleneck in every business, and you have to leverage. And they, you, you have to come to the freaking realization they can do it better than you. Yep. But that's tough for a control freaks like you and I, <laughs> right? And and that's that's that. But you have to you have to absolutely do that. And uh, on that note, um, th- that's certainly one answer to the question I'm about to ask you. But what what are some characteristics that you believe leaders should possess? Oh. You softballed this one to me. Mm-hmm. Leaders do two things, mm-hmm. right? They give credit and they take responsibility. Oh, I like that. That's Above a great anything answer. Else. Give that, credit, take responsibility. That is a great freaking answer, brother, for a 23-year-old. Holy cow, that is a great answer. Yeah, I remember, you know, I've had some big companies, 60, 70 employees, 80 employees, and, and 
And I used to make myself, like I wrote down in my planner, go congratulate five people today, every single day. Go just find something right mm -hmm. to talk about. And uh, that's how you build an, incre build an incredible culture. Absolutely. People, people, you know, you can pay bonuses and do all sorts of things. And I try to do things like that. But people appreciate, you know, the the validation and the acknowledgement more than anything else. That's a great answer, buddy. Very impressed. Now, I know you've started a company called Bright Investor, and it's a market research company. And uh, I think your tagline, and it's, it's brightinvestor.com if you want to check it out, guys. And your tagline is real estate research made simple. You know, and we talk about, you know, we talked about this before we started recording. There are, you know, a lot of demographical sites, census.gov, mm -hmm. you know, uh, bestplaces.net, datausa.io, and you, you, you basically accumulate um, research so someone can search based on a zip code, an address, a city, whatever, and, 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 and you know, that's, uh, that's cool. That's very, very cool. So um, if you could give one piece of advice to my listeners, what would you give them? What would you tell them? I would tell them, have urgency in your ambitions, but the patience to do it right. It's so funny you said urgency. That's one of the, I think that's one of the precursors to success. You know, successful people have to have urgency. And it's not that they don't like you, they just have something to do. And that's exactly. why they're moving and making things happen. And a lot of people struggle with that. But that's, that's really... Uh, you know, one of the biggest factors of success, I do talks on habits, you know, and, and strategies for success and urgency is absolutely one of the most important topics. So I'm really glad you brought that up. The other piece, though, the patience piece, explain that a little bit. I think when you start as an entrepreneur or in real estate space, you are so excited because you've seen the vision. You have this picturesque vision of what your life's going to be like, what you're going to be able to create. And that makes that gives you that fire to continue to do the dedication and be disciplined and the actions it takes to get there. But in doing so, sometimes you turn the heat up too much hmm. and you're actually melting away the foundations of what will be a very stable foundation for to build a, a business on top of. And so if you do it too quickly, if you rush things, if you trip over yourself and you don't take the time to make sure that while you're doing things urgently, you're doing things correctly, you can create a shaky foundation that won't be able to support the vision you're trying to build. Is this based on personal experience? A little bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same here. No, that's a great description, buddy. I'm really impressed with some of these answers from you. So what comes first, finding the deal or finding the money? Oh, finding the deal. I mean, finding the deal. Once you got a good deal, money comes in, you know, by and large. You know, if I can find a good deal in a good market. I'm going to push back on that one. Okay. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to push back okay. on that one. Because I think finding the money right now is going to be harder than finding the deal. Mm. Because a lot of investors are, are very shaky right now. So here's my answer to you, and this is what I teach at my boot camp. Um, and that is both. They both come first. You need to be work. You need Perfect. to be building relationships with investors all the time. Yes. If someone holds still long enough, they need to know what it is you do. You're gonna work for that question. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Right. You want to work for that question, and and I'm so glad you asked. You know, I <laughs> I uh, you know I invest in multifamily properties. I'm super excited about where we are in the market cycle right now. I really believe exponential deals are coming. So I'm kind of coming out of my skin. By the way, if you know anybody that you know be interested in partnering, mm -hmm. let me know. I'm always looking for partners, and I call them partners. Exactly. They're not necessarily just investors, but. Uh, you know, there's a quick elevator pitch that you can use. But um, most mornings, I do kind of a Hal Elrod miracle morning kind of a setup in the morning. I, I, I uh, well, I jump in my cold plunge. I actually exercise now in the afternoons. I used to do it in the mornings, but I journal a little bit. I do a light meditation where I, you know, do gratitude for the things that I mm -hmm. want. What do you do in the mornings? Do you have a morning ritual, morning routine? Yeah, recently it's been used, leveraging the Pareto principle and tw 20 for the 80. I'm saying this all the time to people around me get up in the morning and look at my calendar, look at the things that are coming in the pipeline, and I look at what the 20% of actions I can take that are gonna give me 80% of the results today. It's called the Pareto Principle, guys, or Pareto, Pareto, a guy 300 years ago came up with this. On every list, there are always a small number of items that will get you exponentially further. Typically, the things you don't wanna do. Exactly, it's almost right. always the yeah, things right, you don't wanna right, do. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I teach a, plan, a weekly planning process, uh, uh, and, by the way, if you're listening and you haven't done your goals recently, go to rodslinks.com, and at the bottom is my goal-setting workshop. I do it every year on New Year's Day. The reason I bring this up, at the tail end of that, I do my weekly planning process, and I teach you that. And, you know, it's how I manage two very large companies at the same time. And one of the pieces of that is when you've got your list done, you incorporate the Pareto Principle, and you you look at that, and then you take that 20%, and you actually block time for that. Yes. So you 
for sure get it done. So from 8 to 10, I'm doing this. 10 to 12, I'm doing that. And then you're incredibly effective because you're focused on what, what's going to move the needle the furthest. Good answer. So what inspires you? Man, what inspires me is being able to have the opportunities for things to come along and be able to choose them. And so what I've kind of discussed and told people along my journey is I'm pretty young and uh, it's no secret to anybody that I've got a lot of experience, a lot, a lot of experience yet to gain and a lot of wisdom coming on the pipeline in the years to come. And while I'm young, there's so many things I haven't been exposed to. And so well, one of my driving factors, one of the things that's inspired me to continue to continue on this path has been, I may not know exactly what I want right now, but when that person, that place, that hobby, or that idea comes into my life, that movement that I'm really passionate about enters my life, I wanna be able to choose it wholeheartedly with nothing holding me back. How do you know, you, how are you gonna recognize it when you see it? The people around me and um, those the things that from I remember when I was a child that always gave me a lot of joy. Mm. Um, when I was a kid, I was very involved in drama, act drama and theater. Really? And yes, mm. loved it. And those were some of the happiest moments in my life, hmm. uh, being able to go and perform and uh, work no with people kidding. together. No kidding, wow, yeah. good for you, good for you. Greatly enjoyed it. Love it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I have really embraced these last, you know, 20 years is, is buying all the things that I always wanted, you know, mm -hmm. all the stupid crap that I thought was important. And, you know, some of it sits unused, but I, I love having it. I love playing with some of it. You know, I've, I collect and I'm collecting these model ships, these big model ships. I saw one downstairs. Yeah, you yeah. saw them coming up. I've got two more coming the next day or two. And, you know, and, and um, you know, so, so I, I feel you. So, you know, that, that will not go away. Um, is there a question you wish I would have asked you? I think the question I would have asked is, um, any regrets? Okay. Any regrets? All right. So, what what regrets do you have? The regrets that I have would be. Hmm. I know it's weird, but not getting started sooner. <laughs> yeah, not getting started sooner, and. You need uh, to let that one go, yeah. brother. Just tell you. But there's there's a deeper reason let... behind it too. Okay. Uh, the deeper reason being, almost all my childhood was built around this belief of good grades, good college, good job. And it, a lot of that was not necessarily my own vision or my own dream, but what I believed I needed to be doing in order to be uh, the someone, right person. Some, you live in someone else's life, exactly. honestly. And, and you know, I, I tell the story about this uh, hospice nurse in Australia that, that asked patients, her patients that were dying a question, do you have any regrets? Mm -hmm. And then number one regret was what you just said, living someone else's life, not living what I know I'm capable of, not doing mm -hmm. you know, what I know I'm capable of. Well. You're good, buddy. Okay, you're good at your age. You're you're just fine. Okay, and and if you're listening and you're 60, you're still good. It's okay. You just get freaking started. Okay, pick your vehicle mm -hmm. now. Okay, because it's coming. Everything's going on sale. Absolutely. So figure out how you're going to capitalize on what's coming and 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 get up to speed as fast as you possibly can. Donato, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and I don't say that every time I do one of these interviews. This has been a real treat, and I can't wait to see where you're at five years from now in fact circle back to me and make sure you get on my show in a few years okay because i want to see and, and and we'll see how quickly you close the gap to what you want um yeah i'm excited to see what you come up with thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure and i've really enjoyed our conversation as well and i'll hold you to that i'll love to come back no, in absolutely years. done deal buddy done deal okay take care guys so one other quick thing we encounter so many people that are frankly frustrated. You know, they're looking in the mirror and they're frustrated that they haven't been able to escape the rat race. They haven't been able to build cash flow to the point where they're able to have financial and time freedom with their families. You know, and maybe they see other people buying real estate and creating, you know, incredible cash flow. And they think, well, it's just scary. You know, buying apartments is intimidating. And I get it. See, that's why we created our Warrior Mentorship Program. They're our coaching students and they've had extraordinary results. My students, I've been teaching about five years and they own upwards of 140,000 units now that we know of, right? And we feel like it's just getting going. Now we're looking to grow this group and really take it to the next level. And honestly believe that the greatest transfer of wealth could be upon us right now with this current economic environment. Everything's going on sale. 
So we're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework, really like a blueprint or a map, literally step by step. And then they're able to leverage our systems and our incredible network to raise money and equity, to find deals and close those deals and build partnerships really nationwide. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more, in our incredible network and take advantage of the unbelievable opportunities that are upon us, you can apply to my Warrior Mentorship Program by texting the word CRUSH to 72345. Or you can go to mentorwithrod.com. And what we'll do is we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out and see if it's a fit. Now again, you can go to mentorwithrod.com or text the word CRUSH to 72345 to apply and we will speak soon.